So the beauty of this approach is that it allows us to study the genealogy, if you like, of individual cells. We can follow them by recording their behavior through multiple cell divisions before we impose a stress such as the drug isoniazid. We then expose them to the drug um, for whatever period of time we desire, which of course leads to the, the death of most of the cells, with the exception of the rare persisters. But then we can readily identify these persisters as cells that fail to lyse and which recover growth after we wash out the drug. And now we have a complete record through time of the behavior of these cells and their ancestors. So we can now ask, is there anything that we can identify that's different about these cells, either before, during, or after the exposure of the drug that causes them to be persisters when 99.9% .9 of their siblings are not? So using this type of approach, it was possible for the first time to test an hypothesis that was proposed many years ago, in fact, more than 60 years ago now, by Joseph Bigger in a classic paper where he looked at the response of uh, Staphylococcus, in fact, to treatment with penicillin, again, in a test tube, and for the first time observed uh, this persister phenomenon and coined the term persister. He suggested, it was purely hypothetical, but it was quite a brilliant insight, in fact, that the persisters might be insensitive to the penicillin because they might be in, temporarily in a dormant or non-dividing phase, similar to bacteria that have exited the cell cycle due to, say, nutrient starvation. And uh, this would make sense because penicillin kills bacteria only when they're undergoing active cell growth and division. So that was Bigger's hypothesis back in the 1940s. It had to wait 60 years, in fact, for experimental validation using newly developed tools for time-lapse microscopy and microfluidics. And this was reported in a paper published in the year 2004 by Balaban and colleagues. Uh, there's the reference for those who are interested in which they used microfluidic cultivation of Escherichia coli to study at single cell resolution the response of these bacteria to the drug ampicillin, a beta-lactam. So the persister in this case is circled here in red. So I'll ask you when the movie plays to focus on that cell. As you can see, the cells around it are actively growing and dividing, but that pair of cells is not growing. Ampicillin is added and the cells die, but when it's washed out, these cells are capable of resuming growth. And in fact, if you follow them long enough, they eventually resume rapid growth that is indistinguishable from the growth, of, uh, the growth rate of their siblings who died in response to the drug. So using this type of approach, Balaban and colleagues were able to demonstrate that Bigger's hypothesis in fact was correct, that the persisters comprise a pre-existing, and that's the important point, this is not an adaptation to the drug, it's a pre-existing subpopulation of bacteria that are temporarily in a slow or non-dividing state and are therefore protected from the killing action of this drug. The actual mechanisms that are responsible for generating these persisters are likely to be stochastic, but they have not been identified. Likewise for reactivation of these persisters after washout of the drug. So that's a major challenge for the future is to try to understand the underlying molecular processes that allow these cells to become persisters. But at least in the cellular level, uh, in the case of E. coli, it seems to be very clear that Bigger, in fact, was correct. Persisters are a pre-existing uh, subpopulation of non-growing cells. So when we began to uh, collaborate with this group to study using these same approaches, the persister phenomenon in mycobacteria, focusing at first on the drug isoniazid, we had a rather strong bias at the outset that the persister phenomenon in mycobacteria was going to be very similar for the reasons I've already described and uh, which uh, Mitchison proposed, namely that drugs like isoniazid kill bacteria only when they are actively growing and dividing, and therefore it would make sense that the persisters would be these cells that are in a temporarily non-growing state. So that was our assumption when we began these experiments, or our hypothesis, rather, when we began these experiments. But the beauty of doing science is that our ideas about the world are never as interesting and complex as the world itself. And so we found, in fact, very quickly that this idea was wrong and that what had been discovered in E. coli, in fact, apparently does not apply to mycobacteria.